Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Now, this is a prophecy of the coming Messiah and uh, what he would do for his people. Look at what it says. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. It's about Jesus, right? To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God 
to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And may God add his blessings to the reading and preaching of his holy word and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the teachings of your word. Lord, help us to endeavor now to understand what it takes to really find healing for the scars of shattered confidence. Open our eyes that we might see the truth. Open our ears that we might hear our minds, Lord, and our hearts that we might understand the deeper truths that you have for us. Help us to see life the way you see it, Lord. Fill us with the anointing of your Spirit. Father, I pray that you'd use this message and messenger as you see fit that you do in every heart where only you can do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Today we are continuing on in this series of messages we started last week called Increasing Your Confidence. Because we all have a need for more self-confidence, especially in light of all the things that's happening now. But we live in a world that tends to tear down the self-esteem and the confidence that God wants us to have as Christians. And so the result is a culture of people then who are insecure in their relationships, insecure in their abilities, and even insecure in their relationship to God. And so we need to discover how to increase our God-given confidence in life. Now, many years ago, there was a famous plastic surgeon named Dr. Uh, Maxwell Maltz. And he wrote a book entitled, New Faces, New Lives. And, uh, and in it, he tells story after story of people whose lives were transformed when they got a new face. And he tells about how many of them had been in accidents and, and how they had major scars that made them feel inferior and insecure and inconfident about life. But, but after they got a new face, they seemed to blossom with this new confidence. They just had, seemed to have this new confidence. And, but Maltz said this, he said that as time went on, though, most of those folks who had received new faces, he said they went right back to their former state of insecurity and inconfidence. Dr. Maltz said that plastic surgery didn't seem to do anything for them over the long haul. And so he came to the conclusion that if you want to have a lasting change in your personality, then you've got to heal the emotional scars, not just the physical ones. You gotta reach inside, not just on the outside. Amen? Amen. You gotta get to the inside. Now, folks, the truth is life is tough at times, and it's tough on all of us. We all go through times of being hurt. We all go through times of being treated unkindly. As a result, we get scars, we get emotional scars. And so today I want us to look at how to heal the scars of our shattered emotions and shattered confidence. How do we find, how do you and I as Christians find healing for those shattered emotions? So we need to start by asking some basic questions, and I think in the process of dealing with this subject, we're going to learn a lot of things that are even relevant to what's going on around us today if we listen carefully. So number one, the first point on your outline is what is, uh, what is it that shatters our, our, uh, our confidence? What is it that scars our confidence internally? What is it that does that? There's a lot of different things involved, but the number one cause of emotional scars is frankly rejection. Rejection is the number one cause. So just write that in there. The answer is rejection. The truth is, we've all faced rejection in our lives, and a lot of us <coughs> face rejection, frankly, on a daily basis. I think we better get used to that. I think we better expect that. Amen? Yeah. I mean, it's coming. I mean, if, if I were to ask you how many of you like to be rejected, I don't think any of you would raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love being rejected. But on the other hand, if I were to ask how many of you have been rejected, I think you'd all raise your hand. You'd all say, yeah, we've all been rejected. We know what that's like. Now, that's because rejection is a part of life. It's because we live in an imperfect world. And so we get rejected by our peers, we get rejected by our parents, we get rejected by our spouses, we get rejected by our teachers, we get rejected by our coaches, we get rejected by our children, we get rejected by, our, by everybody. I mean, and sooner or later, almost everybody rejects you at one level or another, sometimes intentionally, and sometimes not intentionally. Uh, they, they just do it because they just do it. It's just... And so, but we, we experience rejection. It's universal, amen? Yep. Everybody goes through. But the problem with rejection is this, that if you get knocked down enough times, pretty soon you begin to wonder if it's even worth getting back up again. That's the problem. And I see this a lot in teenagers, particularly teenagers who get yelled at a lot or criticized a lot by their parents as they're growing up. And so by the time they reach those teenage years, they stop trying to get back up. And so what they do is they just move on. They just move on, and, and so they do that to avoid more rejection, 
And so they move to things like drugs, or they'll move to alcohol, or they'll move to immoral relationships. There was a time when a lot of young people, lots of young people were moving to games. Uh, they just move on to other things, just so they can avoid the rejection. They can find acceptance any place they can. And that's what they're really looking for. And then some people think, well, if I could just be perfect, then everybody would like me. If I could just be perfect, everybody would like me. If I could just be perfect, then everybody would approve of me. Well, that's not true. Because Jesus was perfect, and yet he was one of the most rejected men in the history of the world. In fact, look at the first verse on your outline there. Isaiah 53, 3, it says, He, Jesus, was despised and rejected by who? Amen. Amen. He was despised, rejected. Look at the next verse, John 1, 11. He came into his own creation, and his own people would not accept him. His own people wouldn't even accept him. So being perfect doesn't qualify you to be completely accepted. It doesn't. Now, there's many forms of rejection. There is social rejection. Boy, we see a lot of that online, right? Uh, social rejection online. There's emotional rejection. Um, but I think the most common form of rejection is verbal rejection. I think that's the most common. In fact, perhaps you've heard phrases like this. You know, someone says to you, um, you have no right to feel that way. I, I don't know if you've ever heard that. I've, I've had people say that to me. I've had people say that to me in counseling. They say, Pastor, you have no right to feel that way. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Of course I have a right to feel it. It's my feelings. They're my feelings. Amen? Amen. They're your feelings. You have a right. But it's a way of rejecting your feelings. It's a way of rejecting you. Statements like that. Or, or someone says, what in the world is wrong with you anyway? Or why can't you be more like so-and-so? Or you've been nothing but trouble since the day you were born. Or you make me sick. Or can't you do anything right? And here's a bad one. Here's a bad one. No wonder you don't have any friends. Phew. Well, that's a bad rejection, isn't it? I mean, somebody says that to you, how does that make you feel? What do you mean I don't have any friends? I don't have any friends. I don't have any friends. I'm so rejected. I can't believe you did such a thing. Or you'll never amount to anything. All, of, all those kinds of phrases are forms of rejection, verbal rejection. We, we're rejecting the person. We're rejecting them. Um, and, and there's all the labels then things like you're a klutz you're a jerk, you're a wimp you're no good, you don't matter you're so stupid and on and on it goes I mean a lot of us can still remember even years later hurtful things that were said to us on the playground as kids I mean as we were called ugly or we were called fat or we were called skinny or four eyes or a whole host of other hurtful things you're called short <laughs> You know, there's a saying that goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I wish that were true, but unfortunately it's not. Because words do hurt, and names do hurt, and attacks on our appearance hurt. It hurts. Folks, broken, broken bones heal, I tell you, much more quickly than broken spirits do. Broken spirits can take years and years and years to heal, if they ever get healed. Um, it, external wounds heal much more quickly than internal wounds do. Look at the next verse on your outline, Proverbs 12, 18. It says, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. How many of you would agree with that one? Mm -hmm. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. Now, I think this, this subject that we're talking about is important. I, I think it's important to Christianity, even in the midst of all that's happening in our world and our country today. Because I'll tell you what, I think Christians, have to, we have to treat one another now like we've never treated one another before. And, or maybe we have, but, but I think we need to mount, now make a point of doing it. In other words, we can't treat one another with thoughtless words anymore. We can't do that. We can't be a divided body anymore. Amen? I mean, we have to be unified in these last days. There has to be unity in the body of Christ, and it has to be centered around the Word of God and centered around the love of Christ and respect and admiration for one another as God's children. Amen? Amen. I mean, we've got to do that. Thoughtless words can wound, though, as deeply as any sword. Um, so we all face rejection, and when we're rejected over and over and over again, we start even to then reject ourselves, and then we reject others. Once you start to reject yourself, then it turns to others. And it's funny how that works, but that's the way it works. We get rejected, then we, after a lot of rejection, we start to reject ourselves, then we reject other people, and ultimately what happens then is it turns to a rejection of God because we begin to reject everything. We just do. 
And that's because our self-confidence bottoms out. We're no longer confident about who we are, even in relationship to God. So the next question then is this. Here's point number two on your outline there. The next question is, what is it then that heals our confidence? What brings healing to it? How does God heal the scars that shatter our self-confidence? The answer is he does it through the transforming power of God. He does it through the transforming power of God. Now, it's nice to say that, but you've got to figure that out. You've got to figure out how that works. Look at the next verse on your outline there, Psalm 147.3. It says, God heals. In fact, let's read this together. Ready? Here we go. God heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Wow, God does that. Kind of like the Good Samaritan. Remember that? The story of the Good Samaritan? That's what God does for us personally, though. That's a, that's a great verse. Really, all I want to try to say to you this morning is this, that if you've been hurt, God wants to help. And God cares about your hurt. And he wants to help you. God wants to bind up the brokenhearted. He wants to bind up the wounds in our lives. You say, well, great, fantastic. How's he going to do that? Look at the next verse, Romans 12, 2. This is really the key. This is how it happens. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of what? This world. Do not do not, is that a suggestion? No. no, it's a commandment. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but instead let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your what? Mind. Of your mind. By a complete change of your mind. Now, like you've heard me say many times, the way that you think affects the way that you feel, and the way that you feel then affects the way that you act. If you're acting depressed, it's because you feel depressed. And if you're feeling that way, it's because you're thinking depressed thoughts. So when God wants to change us and he wants to set us free from the scars of our past, from all those hurts from our parents and our partners and our peers and, and, and the lost people of the world who would attack Christianity and attack our faith and, and attack us and reject us because of who we are and Christ and all that kind of stuff, the way God does that is he does it by changing the way we think. By changing the way we think. Have you ever been in one of those fun houses where you have those mirrors that are distorted, you know, and, and you walk in front of the mirror and one mirror makes you look really bigger, one makes you look twisted, one makes you look wide, one makes, I mean, it, 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 taller, shorter. All. When you look at a distorted mirror, what you get is a distorted image of yourself. That's what you get. Now, <clears throat> when you were growing up, the adults in your life were those mirrors. As you're growing up, the adults in your life are those mirrors. And do you know any perfect adults? No, I don't. Uh, are, are you a perfect adult? No, no you're not. Um, so we give and we get distorted images of ourselves all the time. Now, I say that because not only do children get it as we're growing up, we get it from our parents, but we get it from the other adults around us. I think particularly even from our teachers. I think in many ways, as, as contemporary adults, in our childhood, a lot of our distorted images came from our teachers, probably more so than our parents, and I'll tell you why. As we were growing up in public school, we spent a lot more time with our teachers than we did with our parents. Mm -hmm. Even though our, our parents had a more profound effect that was more intense, still, the images that we developed of ourselves, a lot of it came from our teachers. And, uh, and, and so when we're growing up, we see these adults around us who become then the image of what we see ourselves as. They give us the image of who we are. See, the truth is, you, you bought into a lot of lies about yourself when you were growing up that just weren't true. Um, lies like you don't matter. Or lies like you're insignificant. Or you're never going to amount to anything. Or you don't count. Or you're a sissy. Or you're a tomboy. Or you must be gay. I mean, all of these things. And, but after a while, you, you, know, you start buying into that kind of junk and you start believing it. I, I tell you, I think that's one of the reasons we have such an epidemic today of, of children who believe that they're gay or they believe they're bisexual or they believe that they're trans something or trans this. It's because teachers in the public schools are, are, are trying to teach the children that that's very possibly what they are. They're getting a reflection of that. And now it's, it's changing their image of themselves. They're buying into the lies. After a while, you start buying into that kind of junk. And the younger you are, when you start experiencing that kind of rejection, the deeper the lies. 
the deeper they go. Because as a kid, you just tend to accept what other people are saying about you as being true. And listen, this is key. I, I want you to get this. Listen, when you get false information, you come up with a false conclusion. When you get a false, Amen. when you get false information, you come up with false conclusions. Now, let me just be honest. That's what fake media excels at. The fake media today excels at that. False information leads you to false conclusions. And so God comes into our life, and God says, "Hey, I want to change all of that." And God wants to change that by changing the way that you think. In fact, that's the next key thought on your outline there. God changes us and transforms us by changing the way that we think. Oh, I think God's blessing us with some rain today. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said amen. Yeah, yeah, here it We'll see how long it lasts, but praise God. Yeah. At least 10 minutes. At least 10 minutes, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah. That'll get enough for some ground to be. A little bit more. Than it's rough for Chris. I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to get out and drive me, too. Oh, that's it. Oh, man. But God changes oh, us. Let's get back to it. God changes us and transforms us by changing the way that we think. This is key. Look at the next verse on your outline there, John 8, 32. Jesus said, and you will know the what? The truth. The truth. And the truth will set you how? Free. free. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. What is the truth? The truth is Jesus. Amen? Yeah. And Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. So you've got to know the Word to know Jesus. If you know Jesus, then you're going to know the Word. Amen? You're going to get to know the Word. And it's that truth that sets you free. Listen, if you want to be free from the scars of your past, you need to fill your life with the truth because it's the truth that does set us free. You know, when we're children, a lot of kids believe in fairy tales. We, we believe in pixies, and, and you know, a lot of kids believe in the Easter Bunny, and they believe in the stork that brought the babies and you know and all that kind of stuff but as you grew up reality forced you to change your belief system didn't it as you matured as you grew up and you finally learned the truth it freed you from childish beliefs and it forced you to face reality right the truth does that perhaps it's time for i think some folks to grow up and it's time for a lot of folks in our country to let go of some of the things that people said to them a long time ago that just wasn't true about them. And they need to learn the truth. And so today, I just want to give you five things that God says about us. Five things God says about us. In other words, this is God's view of you. This is the truth about you from God's Word. See, you got a choice in life. You can either get your self-concept of life from other people and what they say about you, or you can build your life around the truth, around what God says about you. You have a choice, a distorted mirror of what others say, or the truth, and if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. It'll bring healing. Freedom brings healing. So what does God say about me in Christ? He says five things. These are very simple, but I tell you they're life-changing if you really begin to believe them. The first is this, number one, I am acceptable. I, I am just acceptable. I am acceptable. Now, folks, we all tend to work very hard at being acceptable. I mean, we buy things, we wear things, we join things all in an effort just to be accepted. Uh, I mean, did you ever accept a foolish dare as a kid just because you wanted to be accepted? You know, you just, so you accepted a foolish dare, you know, another kid would say, I dare you to do this, you know. But if you do it, then you can become a part of our team. You know, if you do this, then you can become one of us, you know. And, and the truth is, we as kids... We did some crazy and stupid things because we wanted to be accepted. But look at what God says in the next verse on your outline, Ephesians 1, 6. Paul says, God has made us what? Accepted in the Beloved. Would you circle the word in the Beloved right there? Because that word in the Beloved is a reference to Jesus Christ. That's who it's talking about. The, the Beloved is Jesus Christ. And then circle the word accepted because what it's saying there is that God has made us and has accepted us in Jesus Christ. That's literally what it's saying. God has accepted us in Jesus Christ. Then look at the next verse, Romans 15, 7. Paul says, therefore, accept who? One, one another. another. You know, instead of rejecting one another, accept one another. Why? Just as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. So accept one another. Now I want you to look at these, these uh, two verses, and then let me ask you, are there any conditions on those two verses? Do you see any conditions there? There's no conditions. Does he say you have to earn the acceptance? No, you don't have to earn it. Does he say you could ever deserve it? No. 
it just says that God has accepted you in Christ Jesus. You're just accepted. Now, most of you, if you're not all of you here this morning, I, I, well, all of you, I trust, are born-again believers in Christ. That means that every true believer has been accepted uh, by Christ. Uh, it, but it, it, it means we have accepted Christ into our lives, right? As a, as a believer, you've accepted life through Christ into your life. We talk about that a lot. Have you accepted Jesus? Have you, have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your life? And, and we want to know that from we want people to be able to say, yeah, I believe. When we say, I've accepted Christ in my life, you know what we're really saying? We're saying, I believe the truth. I believe the truth of what God says. And so I've accepted Christ on the basis of the truth that I believe now. So I've accepted Christ. But do you, do you understand that God has accepted you now? That God has really accepted you? That, that we accept Him, but He accepts you as well. And you can never really fully accept yourself and understand yourself until you understand you've been accepted by God. I mean, listen, God has accepted you unconditionally. Now, if that's all I said this morning, we'd still have a lot to think about this week. The fact that God loves me unconditionally and accepts me in Christ for who I am, irregardless of everything about me. In fact, look at the next verse on your outline in Psalm 27, 10. It says, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. In the King James Version, it says, The Lord never will. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord never will, but the Lord will receive me. That's a wonderful verse. Because the truth is, a lot of us grew up with unpleasable parents. I mean, some of our parents were perfectionists, and no matter how much you tried, you could never win the approval of your parents. You just never could. I, I, I never had a dad, really, that I remember trying to win the approval of my dad, but I tried to win the approval of my grandpa. And I wanted the approval of my grandpa so bad, I wanted his approval. But I never got it. My, my grandpa never once told me that he approved of me, or, or that he was proud of me, or thought, that he thought I was something special. He never, never said that to me. Never made even the implication of that to me. And, and it was something that I looked for for a long time. Um, in fact, maybe there are people today who are still, they're, quote, grown up, but they're still looking for the approval of their parents or that special person in their life, still trying to prove your value to them, still trying to earn the approval of, of somebody who's rejected you. I, I want to just say two things about that. Listen, first of all, is in all likelihood, you're never going to get it. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, you're never going to get it. Not because of who you are, but because of who they are. And, and for one reason or another, the way they're formed or whatever, they're just never going to give it to you for one reason or another. I, I don't know why. That's on them. But for you to pursue that, just understand you're probably never going to get it. But secondly, let me just say, you don't need it. You really don't need it. You don't need their approval in order to be happy. Now, what a relief that is when you finally understand that and accept that. I mean, look, look, look at it this way. There are 8 billion people in the world, so who cares if one or two people don't approve of everything you do or don't do? I mean, why focus on those two, just find others who do approve of you, and let your focus be on them? Now listen, this is God's view of you. You are acceptable. Would you just say this out loud? Say, I am acceptable. I am acceptable. Say it one more time with a little energy. I, I am acceptable. acceptable. All right, there you go. All right. So not only does God say you're acceptable, but here's number two. God says, I'm also valuable. I am valuable. Look at the next verse on your outline. I'm valuable. Luke 12, 24. Jesus said, look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or have barns to store away their food, and yet they give along all right. God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. That's the Living Bible version of that verse. I like that. You're far more valuable to him than even the birds that he takes care of every day. You're valuable. Look at the next verse, Isaiah 43, 4. God says, I will give up whole nations to save your life because you are precious to me and because I love you and give you honor. God says, you're precious to me. That makes you valuable to God. You're precious, so you're valuable. I'm more than acceptable. I'm valuable. I'm worth something. I'm significant. You're significant. How much are you worth? That's a good question. How much are you worth? Now, I'm talking about just money because all too often we confuse self-worth self -worth with net worth, but let, let's go back to money for just a second. How much would you be worth if it came to money? How much would you really be worth? I read an article out of the Journal of Hospital Practice. 
And Dr. Uh, Harold J. Morowitz of Yale University did a study and he calculated how much all of the enzymes and hormones and organs and all the different elements of your body are worth on the open market. And by the way, in China, they do sell organs like that on, on the open market. They do kill people. I, I mean, that happens in China right now. They'll kill people on the street. They'll kill them and harvest their organs right there in front of everybody. They do it. Uh, you, you say that's not true. Yes, it's true. And there's, there's, there's video evidence of it all over the place. I mean, they, it's, they, they just they ban it from the internet, so, but it, it, it's, it's there. Uh, Christians have seen it and witnessed it, and, and they'll harvest mm -hmm. it because they're worth so much, they're, 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 they're valuable. But how much, uh, Dr. Uh, Morowitz did a study of this, the enzymes, horm hormones, organs, all the different, and, and, and so he added them all up, and he said, if you're the average sized person, based on a catalog of supply companies, he said, he added it all up and he said, an average person is worth $6,015.44. Six million fifteen dollars and forty-four cents, and that's based on your weight. So I guess some of us are worth a little more than <laughs> others. But uh, you know what that means? That means I'm a six million dollar man, <laughs> and so are you. That's what it means. The doctor said that he estimates that if you could turn your body parts though into molecules, if you could reduce them to molecules and then into cells and then into cell components, he said the figure then jumps from six million to six billion, and ultimately to six hundred trillion. And then he said, on top of that, if you were to calculate the cost of creating each cell in your body, it would be about $6,000 trillion. In other words, you know what he's saying? You're priceless. You're priceless. No wonder God says you're precious to him. You're priceless. In fact, Jesus thought that this was so important that he took a whole chapter in the Bible to talk about it. You know, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories. He tells the story of the lost coin, the lost son, and the lost sheep. Remember those stories? And there's the same conclusion drawn in every story, and that's that you matter to God. He'll do whatever it takes to find you. You matter to God. So I'm going to say this for a second time in this series. You matter to God. You're valuable beyond all measure to God. Would you say this out loud? Say, I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I'm valuable. Number three. See, in Christ, I'm acceptable. I'm incredibly valuable. But number three, I'm also lovable. I'm also lovable. Now, that's what God says about you. He says you're lovable. Now, I know that as you look at some people, that may be hard to believe at times. But you are lovable. You are. I mean, when I first get up in the morning, I don't look too lovable, and yet I'm still lovable to God. Amen? Still lovable. Now, this is really important, folks, because, look, you can't really love anybody else until you love yourself. Amen. It's true. Um, until you feel lovable... Until that happens, you can't really love your neighbor as you love yourself. And to be honest, I wouldn't want to be loved by some people the way that they love themselves. I wouldn't want to be loved by it because, I mean, they don't treat themselves very well, so why would they treat me any better? Amen? Amen. Look, look at the next verse, Isaiah 54, 10. It says, the mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you, Jesus says, God says, my love for you will never end. I will keep forever my promise of peace. So it says the Lord who, what? Oh. That's a beautiful verse. God says, my love for you is never going to end. Now, that verse also has a couple of things about his love. First, he's, his love, he loves you consistently. That's what he says in there. And secondly, he loves you unconditionally. God loves you consistently. In other words, he's not fickle. He doesn't love you one day, and then the next day he doesn't love you anymore. He loves you one day, doesn't love you the next day. That's not what God is. He doesn't love you on your good days and then not on your bad days. Now, now, all of us have grown up with conditional love, and that's because we're human beings, and, and we have human beings as parents, and so we understand what conditional love is like and what that is. In fact, one lady I knew once in counseling, she said, she said, Pastor, when I was growing up, she said, I didn't know if I was going to be hugged or slugged by my dad. He was so fickle. I didn't know what, how he was going to treat me from day to day. But God isn't like that. God says, I will always love you, and it will never end, and it's unconditional love. The point is, you don't have to earn God's love. There's nothing you have to do to earn his love for you. God, God's love is not, I love you if. You know, I love you if you're a good person. I love you if you do certain things. No, it's, it, it's not an if kind of love, and it's not a because kind of love either. You know, I love you because you're a particular way. I, I, I love you because you look like this, or I love you because you act a certain way. It's not a because or an if kind of love. See, that's all conditional love. It, it's, it's loving someone based on the fact that they meet certain conditions. But what happens when they fail to meet those conditions? Well, that's when the love stops. If that person no longer meets the conditions of your love, then the love stops. That's conditional love. But God says, I don't love you like that. 
God says, I love you consistently, and I love you unconditionally. And by the way, that's how we have to learn to love other people. Amen? That, that's the objective. That's the goal. Come, amen? Right? Amen. It's called agape love. But that's the way we have to learn to love other people. Um, I mean, you, you never have to wake up in the morning and say, God, are you going to love me today? You never have to do that. You never say, God, are you going to love me today? I, you know, God, did I read my Bible enough? God, did I pray enough? God, did I witness enough? Now, that, that stuff's important to the kingdom of God. It's important, but it doesn't determine God's love for you. God just loves you, period. He just loves you, period. So when you finally understand that God really does love you unconditionally, what's the result of that? Well, look at the next verse, Daniel 10, 19. Because the Bible says God loves you, so don't let anything worry you or frighten you. We talked a lot about the end times, about the end days and what's coming and what we're facing right now and everything. But God's love, if you really accept and understand you're loved by God that deeply, Look at what it says. Look at it again. Don't let anything what? Frighten. Worry you or what? Frighten. 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 Don't let anything what? Worry you or frighten. frighten you. Why? Because God loves me. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to worry. I have to face reality. I have to deal with it. I can't run from it. I can't hide from it. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to be afraid of it because God loves me. God loves me. That's a great verse. I mean, that's a... That's a comfort, and that's a confidence builder to have that kind of love. Because when I start getting worried or frightened, all I have to do is I start thinking about God's love for me, and it removes that worry and fear. God loves you, period. Totally, completely, unconditionally. We are loved by God. Say this out loud. Say, I am lovable. I am lovable. You are. Number four, I am acceptable, I'm valuable, I'm lovable. And number four, I am forgivable. I am forgivable. This is who we are. This is who we are. This is the mirror that we need to be looking at, God's Word. I'm forgivable. The truth is, look, none of us are perfect, and we all need forgiveness. But sometimes we don't see God as forgiving. Sometimes we don't. I mean, sometimes when bad things happen, we think God is out to get us then. Because we did something <laughs> bad back then, years ago, God's out to get us today. God's still out to get us. It just hasn't caught up. It's this feeling of just waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, you've heard that phrase, just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Right? It's, this, it's this ominous feeling that some bad things have happened now and things are going too good. I, some, something bad's got to happen now. You know, just waiting for this. Every time something starts going wrong in your life, a lot of people start thinking, why me, God? Why me? And we start thinking that God's getting even with us for something that we did in our past. You tend to think, I knew it, I just knew it, I did that thing four years ago, now God's getting even with me, I made God angry back then, I ticked God off back then, and so this is what happens now, God's just making it right, God's just getting even with me now. Does God really treat his children that way? No, no, he doesn't, not on your life. Look at the next verse on your outline there, Isaiah 43, 25. In fact, read this out loud, let's read this together, ready, here we go. I am the God who forgives your sins, and I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. I will not hold your what? Sins against you. He's not going to do it. That's a great verse. God does not hold your sins again. Once we're forgiven by God, as far as God is concerned, He never, ever, even ever will ever see those sins again. They're, they're out of his sight, out of his mind, out of, it's gone as far as God is concerned. God doesn't hold a grudge. God doesn't hold our sins against us. He doesn't bring up the past. Satan does that. God doesn't do that. Amen. If you start thinking that you're suffering the consequences of something you did a long time ago, and you're still just suffering, I mean, maybe there's physical consequences that you're going to have to suffer because of something you did a long time ago, but certainly not spiritual, and it doesn't have to even be emotional anymore. You don't have to suffer from the spiritual and emotional consequences of sin done a long time ago. It's not God bringing that back up to your mind. It's the devil. It's Satan doing that. And you just tell Satan to take a hike. Because God loves me. God has forgiven me. If you've confessed your sin to God and you've asked God to forgive you, it's a done deal. He'll never bring it up again. So you need to stop bringing it up. And don't let the devil do that. When you confess your sins to God, then God later on isn't going to use those sins against you because... He's mad at you. God doesn't get mad at us. If you're a Christian, God 
isn't mad at you. God doesn't get mad at you because he's forgiven you and your slate has been wiped clean. I mean, for heaven's sake, he's looking for the day when he gets to spend all eternity with you in person. He's not mad at you. God doesn't get mad at you. Now, God may discipline you for your own good. Now, he does do that. That's a great loving father. Amen? That's what he does, but he's not mad at you. I had to discipline my kids when they were growing up. I'd spank them, or I'd send them to their room, or they'd do without this, or do without that. <clears throat> and I'd have to discipline them. And, and there were even times when I had to say, and there were times when I was, as a human man, I was mad. And when I got mad, I had to go and ask them to forgive me, because the truth is, I'm not really mad at you. I'm not mad at you. I wasn't mad at my kids. You know why I wasn't mad at my kids? Because I loved them. They're my children. Amen? Amen? They're my children. We're God's children. He's not mad at us. And he doesn't struggle with human emotion like that. He just loves us, period. Look at the next verse on your outline there, Ephesians 1 4. Paul says, Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided, he decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. He decided when? Before we were ever even created. Before the world was ever. He decided then to make us holy without a single fault. We who stand before him covered with his what? Love. Uh, covered with his love. That's good news, man. That's good news. Do you realize that when God looks at you and he, he sees you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, when he looks at you, he sees you through the blood, the shed blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. So when God sees you, he sees you as completely forgiven without a single fault. We're faultless before God covered with his love. So does that knowledge about God's love and complete forgiveness help you to relate to God better? Well, sure it does, because now you don't ever have to be afraid of God. Amen. You don't have to fear God in that sense. I can go to my Father. I can go to my Heavenly Father. I don't have to be afraid of that, even despite the fact that I just messed up big time. I just go to Him and I say, God, please forgive me and help me not to do that again, Lord. Show me how not. See, see what I'm saying? I don't have to be afraid because of his love. See, that's the good news of what it means to be a Christian. I, I give God all my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he takes all of that, and he forgives me, and then he gives me a fresh start on life. And now he says, when I see you, I see you without a single fault. Regardless of the worst thing that you've ever done, you are still forgivable. God can and does still forgive you. God can still forgive you, and he wants you to experience his forgiveness every day in your life. Now, folks, that reality ought to help produce a stronger sense of confidence in your life. It really should. In fact, say this with me. Say, I am forgivable. I, I am, am forgivable. forgivable. Thank God. I'm acceptable. I'm valuable. I'm lovable. I'm forgivable. There's one more. Number five, I am capable. Yeah. Yeah, you are. You're capable. You're very capable. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you right now that you are capable way more than what you even believe you are. You're capable of way more than what you even think you are. You're capable. Look at the next verse, Philippians 4.13. Paul says, I have strength. Paul, is Paul saying? And he's talking about himself there, but he's also talking about us in, in reference to us. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything. You know what that means? It means I'm capable. I'm ready for anything. I'm equal to anything. Through him who infuses inner strength into me, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. <laughs> When you're feeling a little drained and a little weak, try reading that verse because it'll pick you up and give you energy you never thought you could have. I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. When God puts his spirit in our lives, it gives us confidence to face the challenges that we have to face. Now, I'm not talking about the phony baloney, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, self-help kind of pop psychology that's out there that the world says to build yourself up with. Uh, you know, the kind of thing, well, I'm okay, you're okay. I mean, I, I think that, that that's just nonsense, to be honest. I just think it's nonsense. I, because when I look around, I want to say, I'm not okay, and, and I don't think you're okay either. Right? I mean, when we look around, we're not really all that okay. But then God says, I'm okay. And if God says, I'm okay, well, then that's okay. Yeah. Okay? Okay. 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 All right. so, but it's what God says that really matters. Irregardless of how I feel. Irregardless of what I think. I'm not okay, you're not okay, it doesn't matter. God says I'm okay. That's what matters. As I, as I look at some of you, I recognize that 
that you guys really, to be honest, are, are successful at a lot of different things. You guys in your own right, in your own ways, are successful at a lot of different things. And yet despite that, still inside some of you, there may still be sin, a, still a growing sense of insecurity, a feeling of a lack of confidence, and maybe you're feeling a bit incompetent in some ways. Why is that? Well, I can tell you that the answer lies in the fact that you're still listening to some of the old tapes of your past. That's why. And you keep replaying those old tapes over and over again in your mind, and you're still acting on the basis of things that people said to you 10, 15, even 20 years ago, and it wasn't true then, it wasn't true when they said it in the first place, and it's not true now. Yeah. But we keep replaying those tapes. You know, things like, you don't matter. That's a lie. You do matter. We've said that already in God's Word. Amen? You do matter. Or things like, you're a loser. That's a lie. In Christ, you're a winner. Amen? You're more than a winner. Or you'll never amount to anything. That's a lie. God has an incredible plan for your life. Incredible plan. Those old tapes keep going over and over again in your mind. And we keep comparing ourselves to other people, to our brothers, to our sisters, to, to people that we know that, you know, well, I've got to prove that I'm better than they are. I've got to prove that I'm strong. I've got to make more money than they do. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. That's not God's plan for you. God's plan for you is not to compare yourself to other people. God's plan for you is to be who he created you to be. Amen. And be confident in that. And let God do whatever he wants to do in your life. In that capacity. Let him take you where he wants to. Let him do what he wants to do with you. You need to quit believing the old lies and start believing God's truth about you. Stop looking and listening to those distorted mirrors of what other people have said and maybe are saying. And start really listening to what God says about you. That's why it's so important that we turn to God's Word and we stay in God's Word. God says very clearly, you're acceptable, lovable, valuable, forgivable, and you are capable. That's the truth about you as a Christian. And it's in that acceptance of that truth that you're going to find the scars healed and your self-confidence restored so that you and I can face the challenges of this insane world that we're in right now. Listen, there, there's a lot of hurt in the world and that's because we've all grown up with hurtful things being said and done to us, and that's because we live in a fallen world. But I'm going to say you can reverse the hurt. You can reverse the hurtful statements. You can reverse all of that. You can reverse the hurtful things in your life. You can reverse the curse. How do you do that? Well, you do it by receiving the truth into your life. And you've got to reinforce that truth often, and may I suggest to you that that's why it's important to stay in church. I think that's why it's important that in the future house churches continue to grow because that's going to be the place where you're going to continue to hear the truth from God's word. You're going to hear the truth about freedom. You're going to hear the truth about what it means to love God and to be loved by God. You're going to hear that truth and, and, and it's important to do that because it has to be reiterated over and over and over and over again because look, you know, we're in church, we're together, what, a couple hours a week? How much time does the world have influencing us in comparison to that? So it's not just a matter of being in church. That's important, but you've also got to stay in the Word, amen, to counteract a lot of what's going on. The point is, we all know what it's like to be rejected. I mean, right now, you're just, frankly, listening to one reject, reject speak to a bunch of other rejects. I mean, we all know what it's like to be rejected. Rejection is a part of life, but it, has to, it doesn't have to define you as a Christian anymore. And I, and, I, and I do want to say something to you, though, about the hurt and rejection you have experienced. I just want to say this. Okay, I want you to know that I'm sorry for the hurt that you've experienced in life. I really am. But I think that if Jesus were standing here right now, you know what I think he would say to us about that hurt, that past hurt? And I think he would say what he's already said to us in Isaiah 61.3. Look at it. It's the last verse. It says, God will give us what? Beauty for ashes. ashes. God will give what? Beauty for ashes. That's what God wants to do. No matter what it is that's been burned down in your life and left for ashes, no matter how much you've been scarred, no matter who did it, God wants to take that hurt and those scars and turn it into something beautiful. God really does want to turn scars into stars if you let him. Let me finish with this story. Listen to this story. Fred Paddock is a Fred Paddock is a famous preacher back in the East. He was. But he was a famous preacher back in the East. And one time he was vacationing with his wife in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And he went into a little restaurant and they sat down. And an older man came up to him and said, Hi, folks. Are you here on vacation? Are you having a good time? And Fred Paddock, the preacher, said, Yes, as a matter of fact, we are having a good time. And the man said, Well, what do you do for a living? Fred said, Well, I'm a preacher. 
And the guy said, oh, that's great. Well, let me tell you a story that you can use in a sermon sometime. And before Fred could stop him, the old man pulled up a chair to the table and he started unwinding his tail to him. And he said, you know, I was born an illegitimate child. That's the way he started the story. I was born an illegitimate child. He said, I never knew who my father was. And that was very hard on me as I was a kid growing up. He said, the boys at school had names that they would call me. And you know what those names are. But they would call me that. They made fun of me because I didn't have a father. And nobody, including myself, even knew who my father could possibly be. He said, when I walked down the main street of our little town, I felt like people were staring at me and asking the terrible question over and over again. I wonder who the father of that little boy is. I wonder who the father really is. So I spent a lot of my time by myself, and I didn't have a lot of friends. He said, but one day a new preacher came to town, and, and he said everybody was talking about how good he was, and I'd never gone to church before, so one Sunday I thought I'd just go and hear this man preach. Well, he was a good preacher, and so I kept going back. And, you know, I was just a little boy, but I kept going back, and each time I would go to church, I would arrive late, but I would leave early so that nobody would talk to me. So I, nobody would look at me and ask and think those terrible thoughts about me. But he said, one Sunday, he said, I got so caught up in the preacher's message that I forgot to leave. And before I knew what was happening, the preacher had said the, ben said the benediction and the service was over. And I tried to get out of the church, but people had already filled the aisles. I couldn't get past them. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. And when I turned around, it was the preacher who was looking down at me. And he asked me, he said, what's your name, boy? Whose son are you? And I, I just shook when he asked that question. But before I could say anything, he said, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute, I know who you are. I know who your family is. Why, there's a distinct family resemblance here. Why, you're the son, you're the son of God. And I'm one of your brothers. That old man who was telling that story looked at Fred Craddock, the preacher there, and, and he said, you know, mister, he said, those words from that pastor that day changed my life. The old man then wished Fred Paddock and his wife well, and he got up and he left and walked out the door. The waitress came over and asked, do you know who that was? And, no, said Paddock, and she said, well, that's Ben Hooper, the two-term governor of Tennessee. Here's the point of the story. A young boy learned that he was a child of God, and that truth, that simple truth, changed his life and the trajectory of his life forever. When you really begin to understand that you matter to God and that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross so that you can be acceptable and valuable and lovable and forgivable and capable, when you understand that, once you really embrace those truths, you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. Right? So, look, I mean, just say there is a distinct family resemblance. There is. You're all sons and daughters of God. And you're my brothers, and you're my sisters. There's a family resemblance, amen? amen? We have everything to be proud of. We have everything to stand up straight for and to be confident in. We are literally, literally the sons and daughters of God Almighty. Amen. And we can stand in the confidence of that. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you can heal broken hearts, and you can heal bitter memories, and you can heal damaged self-esteem. You can, you can change the trajectory of our lives. Thank you that old patterns can be erased and, and old patterns can even be reversed. We can be set on a new direction every day. Lord, there's, I know there's a lot of hurts maybe represented here, and so we ask that you would heal us. Touch hurting hearts. Touch confused minds with your healing touch of love. Help us to feel your love deeply today and, and, and may we let go of the hurt and in its place, replace it with the reality of the fact that you love us. Help us to know that we are acceptable and valuable and lovable and forgivable and yes, God, completely capable in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help each of us to really believe that by really believing the truth of your word because it's that truth that will set us free. Father, this is what a biblical worldview is all about. It's first understanding a biblical view of ourselves. Lord, help us to do that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He fill you with all of His goodness and may He just empower you in the reality of who you are in Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.